Portal is one of those rare examples of a perfect game. I'd like to clarify that statement though. When I call something a perfect game, that doesn't mean it has no flaws, but that the game as is doesn't require any significant changes. There could be changes to a perfect game, but those changes might take away from its perfection. This is how I feel about Portal 2, a game that greatly expanded on the first game, but that also added and changed elements that take away from the experience. In Portal 1, nothing really takes away from the experience in any way. The game design is simple yet flawless, and Portal does a really good job setting up a world within the game space in a very short amount of time, using environmental storytelling to aid the experience while centering the experience itself mostly around the player's interactions with the test chambers. There's a million things that could be said about the Portal series in terms of its design, but I'd actually like to turn away from the gameplay and instead focus on the screenplay. Without beating around the bush, Portal is one of the most well-written video games, if not the most well-written. It walks a very thin tightrope between dark comedy and just pure horror or thriller, and manages to balance the two from start to finish so well that you almost don't notice when it shifts from one to the other on a first playthrough, up until the later portions of the game. So I'd like to talk about how well Portal functions as a dark comedy and as a thriller. Just to get this out of the way, I will not be talking about Portal 2 because if I'm being honest, I don't think it's that well written of a game, and it certainly doesn't come nearly as close to capturing the tone and balance that the first game has. Portal is an example of lightning in a bottle, something that we might never get to see again in games, at least not for a long time. Portal's writing relies on three major components in order to work so well, and that's the gameplay, the setting, and the dialogue slash performance of GLaDOS. First, I'm going to address how the gameplay works with the writing, because it's probably the least interesting topic of the bunch. The game is trying to teach you new mechanics, and Portal as a concept is definitely a very different mechanic than a lot of players might be used to, so the game needs to gradually grow the player accustomed to the new mechanics. They do this by first having the portals be automatic, and then you pick up a portal gun that only has one portal option available, and then you finally pick up the portal gun that has both options available. Similarly, the game starts off with puzzles that aren't time sensitive and can't kill you, to puzzles puzzles that are time sensitive but can't kill you, to puzzles that can kill you, and ramp up the difficulty from there. The reason why the gameplay is relevant to the writing is that the gameplay is trying to simultaneously be a tutorial and a puzzle game, and so the game introduces you to concepts in a safe environment and then lets you figure out how to navigate it on your own over time. In this sense, the game is training wheels for itself, and what makes this clever is that the premise of the game is quite literally a tutorial, so within the world of the game it makes total sense that the pacing works this way. The game is itself a training exercise because the game is about a training exercise. I'll elaborate more on that later. The second component, the setting, is a bit more interesting, though it's been talked about to death. Aperture Science is a setting that is clinical and scientific, but empty in more ways than one. The game uses environmental storytelling to hint at something being amiss, such as office rooms that are visible with no signs of human life within them. The clinical nature of the facility makes it begin as welcoming and warm, with the very opening room having an almost womb-like feeling to it, which I think may have been intentional, considering a lot of the more feminist, or at the very least, feminine themes and undertones of the game. By the time you start to progress through the game, the warm, welcoming facility starts to feel less warm and more cold and hostile, and this is made explicit one of the best bits of environmental storytelling ever put in a game. If you've played the game, you probably know what it is. It's during the section where you meet the companion cube. I'll talk a bit about the companion cube first. The companion cube itself is a really clever idea because the companion cube almost serves as a snapshot of Portal's tone as a whole. When we first pick up the companion cube, it's cute and charming because it has a little heart on it, and it seems innocuous at first, but then the dark undertone creeps in as GLaDOS starts to talk about ominous aspects of the cube like how people seem to think it can speak, and so on. It starts out innocuous, then turns darkly humorous, and then just turns pure dark by the end as you're forced to incinerate it. It's one of those moments where a player might be left to think to themselves, what are the implications of what I've just done? And the game gives no answer, just leaves you with what seems to be a morally negative action. It leaves a sour taste in the mouth, but in a good way where it gives the audience pause. The fact that a cube with a heart on it can cause such a dramatic shift in tone in such a short space of time is indicative of how Portal is able to achieve a balance between funny and dark. Now let's talk about that room. First of all, it's an easter egg, but one that is very deliberately trying to get the viewer to find it. 
Before this moment, we're already treated to a secret room behind the facility in the previous test chamber, and that one was directly hinted at by placing a necessary object right at the entrance into the secret room. You would have to pick up a cube, thus noticing the room behind it in order to progress. So by now, a player is likely to have already figured out that there might be secret rooms behind open walls. So then we find the room, a room which appears to be a loving yet psychotic tribute to the companion cube. This room captures the tone of the game perfectly, in that it is simultaneously unnerving and funny. It's funny seeing the fanatic devotion to a cube with a heart on it, how whoever made this seems to have an obsessive love for the cube. Then it starts to become a bit creepy when you think about the implications. Who was here before? How long have they been there? Are they still here in the facility somewhere? Why would someone become so obsessed with a cube? These questions immediately create a dark undertone where you start to think that maybe Aperture Science is not a place you want to be. And combining that with the incineration of the companion cube, you start to think, maybe GLaDOS is not as friendly as we thought. Speaking of GLaDOS, let's talk about GLaDOS a bit, specifically the dialogue and performance. As far as I can tell, there's a meta joke going on with GLaDOS that a lot of people missed, and this is a major reason I wanted to make this video. Remember when I said I would elaborate more on how the game is about a training exercise? Well, as far as I can tell, a major reason why the game is about a training exercise is because Portal is a tutorial game. It's a game about being a tutorial. By extension, it's a parody of gaming tutorials. How many times have you played a game only for the game to stop you in your tracks, make you listen to some disembodied voice or some small critter that tells you how to play the game? Navi from Ocarina of Time, Omo Chao from Sonic Adventure 2, The King from Katamari Damacy, even a previous Valve game, Half-Life 1, has a tutorial level that forces you to listen to some feminine robot intercom voice tell you how to play the game. Portal is an entire game dedicated to this very concept that subverts the concept by creating a dark comedy take on game tutorials. A disembodied voice tells you how to play the game, but does a poor job as many game tutorials often do. At first, you think that GLaDOS is incompetently programmed or something and it's cute and charming when it glitches out or says a stray line of dialogue that sounds emotionally robotic, like this is a robot on autopilot that just wasn't well made. Then, as the game becomes more dangerous, you might start to think, this robot is going to get me killed, and becomes darkly comedic as the robot seems completely oblivious to the emotional weight of danger, either oblivious to the fact that you might die or seemingly indifferent to the possibility that you might die. The game raises the stakes both as a game and within the game world as the tutorial starts to take on a darker quality, and then the big twist in Test Chamber 19. GLaDOS was not unintentionally trying to kill you because she was on autopilot. No, she was intentionally trying to kill you. The moment when we learn that GLaDOS is self-aware is one of the funniest moments in gaming, specifically because we had so much setup of starting to feel that GLaDOS is indifferent, inhuman, incapable of understanding the consequence of what's going on. GLaDOS appeared to be unaware, which drove a lot of the comedy, but all this comedy becomes recontextualized when we realize that GLaDOS was aware this whole time. That on its own is fucking brilliant. Because the first time playing through, we take GLaDOS for granted as a basic video game tutorial voice, not thinking about darker undertones, while the game slowly reveals them to you. After the twist, playing through it a second time, we begin to see all of the signs that GLaDOS was always off and away from the very start. People may have had a hunch on first playthrough, but hunch leads to confirmation in the second playthrough. The game plays on players' expectations of a typical game tutorial in order to subvert the typical language of games in order to make a great dark comedy and a great thriller. What happens when the game itself wants you dead? The typical player expectation is to listen to the disembodied voice blindly, because based on prior game tutorials, we assume subconsciously that they're acting in our best interest. After all, that's what a game tutorial is. GLaDOS is the helping hand, but GLaDOS is also a textbook example of an unreliable narrator. What makes this brilliant is that the game uses the typical language of most games in order to convince the player, by default, to trust the unreliable narrator. It's how the narrator slowly reveals herself to be unreliable that allows for this excellent balance and darkly comedic tone, and it's when the narrator reveals herself to be an intentionally unreliable that the game shifts in tone altogether. The game begins as a comedy with dark elements and turns into a thriller with comedic elements. GLaDOS's narration in the final portions of the game become both literally and figuratively distant to the player, who now recognizes how phony GLaDOS's statements are, and it becomes funny how dedicated she is towards trying to trick you into letting her kill you. Besides the bigger picture, I want to talk about how the game handles its jokes. 
Portal 2 was, in my opinion, very lackluster with the humor because the punchlines are very similar and very poorly executed. Certainly some people liked it, but I was not even remotely fond of the way that they handled jokes. Because the jokes often followed the basic formula of saying something such as you're fat or you're adopted in a passive-aggressive manner and then explicitly making it aggressive by taking away all implication or subtlety and repeating the point more bluntly that you're fat or adopted. Passive-aggressiveness and mean-spiritedness just felt at odds with what GLaDOS was in the first game. GLaDOS's jokes in Portal 1 typically are based on what appears to be some sort of dramatic irony. GLaDOS will say something inhuman in a nonchalant tone, while the player will hear dark implications. The way that GLaDOS, seemingly oblivious, can make light of the player's humanity and safety out of a cheery lack of human understanding is how the game initially balances dark undertones while creating a generally comedic environment. Let's look at some individual jokes and how they progress. The very first joke of the game is one in which the game warns you that you could get hurt by what's going to happen, and then glitches out when it tells you what to avoid doing. This simultaneously is funny and ominous, in that it creates a situation where the player doesn't know what to expect, but is expecting the worst, and it's also showing that there's something up with GLaDOS, which we eventually realize by the end what that is. One of my favorite jokes is this one. As part of a required test protocol, our previous statement suggesting that we would not monitor this chamber was an outright fabrication. Good job. As part of a required test protocol, we will stop enhancing the truth in three, two, one. I love how this joke plays with irony using the inhumanity of GLaDOS. The phrase enhancing the truth is a great euphemism, and the fact that they count down to the moment when they stop lying to the player is funny enough on its own. But it's when the audio glitches out that the joke evokes the unreliable narrator trope, because it leaves it ambiguous whether or not what GLaDOS is saying is going to end up being true. If the AI can't even attempt to stop lying without glitching, then either way we're put in a bad position. The implication of the humor is unstated, but is clearly understood through the irony in its presentation. To me, this is vastly more well-written humor than Portal 2, which was more overt in, for lack of a better phrase, explaining the joke. Here's another great joke. Please note that we have added a consequence for failure. Any contact with the chamber floor will result in an unsatisfactory mark on your official testing record, followed by death. Good luck. This is one of the first turning points in the tone where it becomes clear that there are serious consequences to what's happening, and GLaDOS's emphasis on your official testing record while downplaying the fact that you'll die shows how distant GLaDOS is to the lived consequences of what's happening. This joke simultaneously uses GLaDOS's status as an AI character to play a bit of dark humor, sets up for the eventual tonal shift towards the end of the game, and also actually functions as a game tutorial for the player, informing them that touching the green liquid will kill them. Instead of just being a disconnected joke that has no relation to what's going on thematically or mechanically, the joke connects to both things excellently, and yet again it leaves most of the humor of the joke unstated, rather than explaining the joke. Here's another favorite joke of mine. The Enrichment Center regrets to inform you that this next test is impossible. Make no attempt to solve it. Fantastic. You remain resolute and resourceful in an atmosphere of extreme pessimism. There's not much to this joke, but I love the juxtaposition between the mechanical experience of this room and the statements that GLaDOS makes. It's clearly hyperbole, but the hyperbole is revealed through the mechanical experience of finishing this test, especially because this is arguably one of the easiest puzzles by this point in the game. Taking barely any time to figure it out after being told it's impossible, and then hearing that this was extreme pessimism, is to me pretty funny, and it also sets the player up to be, in comedic terms, the straight man of the joke, where the player's actions as a player are the setup for the goofy punchline. The relationship between the humor and the actual act of playing the game is well done, and another example of how to approach comedy in a gameplay-oriented experience. The ending of the game, while humorous, isn't really anything to analyze in terms of the dialogue itself, but the way that the dialogue is contextualized. The game flips the tone on its head in this final half hour of the game, as you not only are removed from the relatively safe environments of the test chamber and put into unfamiliar territory, but also are given a degree of power and freedom that you never had before in the previous portions of the game. The training wheels have officially come off by this point of the game, and GLaDOS's tone switches from nonchalant and oblivious to self-aware and desperate. 
The humor stops being about how GLaDOS seemingly has all of the power to kill you, yet none of the intention, to suddenly having every intention of killing you, yet none of the power to do so. This means that why you laugh in the later sections of the game sort of reverses, from a more masochistic tone to a more sadistic tone, though it's all in good fun. The game goes from understated in its humor to overstated, and that actually works when it spends this whole time building up and uses the overstated humor to convey that tone of desperation on behalf of the character. Up until the very end, the tone strikes a perfect balance between actual thrilling experiences and a light-hearted yet darkly comedic atmosphere. Then we get to Still Alive, which was probably the most popular thing to come out of Portal 1, if not the whole bit about the cake. I have nothing to really say about the cake, but as for Still Alive... Look, when I said Portal 1 was perfect, I did mean what I said, in that there is no major change to the game that could improve the product we now have. Having said that, I don't think that the Still Alive song for the credits was a decision that pays off very well for myself. I don't really think it's that funny, and while it is cute and charming, I think that ending on a cute and charming note undermines the balance of the tone up to this point, where the game ends on an exceptionally dark and ambiguous note. It's not even clear if you really survive, although going off of Portal 2 we know that the character does. The game builds up to the big reveal that GLaDOS had killed everyone in Aperture Science, and a cute ending song about how GLaDOS doesn't like you is sort of just out of place for me. That said, in terms of the mimetic aspects of the game, Still Alive is a very catchy song and the tone shift does work in making a more memorable finale to the game, albeit one that doesn't really work for me personally. I do think that the song has cultural relevance, and for that I don't think it would have worked better without the song, but that's my only real complaint about Portal 1 on the whole, although I would also be willing to say it was a little bit short. All in all, Portal 1 manages to do a hell of a lot within a 2-3 to three hour playtime. It constructs a world, balances dissonant tones of lightheartedness and darkness, uses mechanics to interact with the humor of the game, uses the humor to be deliberately instructive to the player, uses instructiveness and humor in order to parody game tutorials and other video games, and does all of this through an implicitly feminine perspective, weaving all of these things into one of the most tightly written pieces of media of its decade, a game that can compete writing-wise with the likes of something like Shaun of the Dead or Hot Fuzz. It's almost so well written that you don't really notice it happening as you play, but the game is working both with and against player psychology in order to create an experience that can start off innocuous and charming and end somewhere much more bleak, while still somehow managing to keep some of the charm and not lose anyone in the process. This game should be a go-to in how to write a video game in terms of how the narrative interacts with the mechanics, in terms of tone command and comedy, and even more importantly, in terms of self-awareness and theming. In other words, this game about tutorials that's a parody of game tutorials, oddly enough, it makes a pretty damn good tutorial on how to approach writing a video game. Thanks for watching. The Enrichment Center promises to always provide a safe testing environment. In dangerous testing environments, the Enrichment Center promises to always provide useful advice. For instance, the floor here will kill you. Try to avoid it.